Uh, just a minute. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, hello everyone. Welcome to this session, The Art of Looking, Engaging with Art Critically, Creatively, and Contextually, uh, held by the Siegel Foundation for the Arts. So, uh, before we start, I just want to give you an overview of uh, this workshop series first. So, these sessions are meant to be an introduction to art through the subject, art history, that is the history of art. So, uh, this is the second part in a two-part series. And in the last session, like Ma'am said, we uh, looked at how we create our individual definitions of art based on what we come across in our lives. And along with that, there are also authorities of art that put certain types of value to artwork. So in this session, we're going to be looking at how, um, looking at the mediums and categories within art. We'll also be looking at how it's part of our everyday lives and different fields that we encounter it in. So uh, let's start with mediums. I think this is something that everyone has heard of maybe at some point in their life. Um, just a minute. Yeah. Uh, what are types of art that you've come across with, uh, come across in your lives? Like, it can be anything. Please feel free to answer. Portraits, abstract art, still life, landscapes. Yeah. Also fashion yeah so can you think of it in terms of some sort of category like uh, two-dimensional art um what other type of categories can you think of mediums in sorry um, that's clear. Yeah. medium mediums can be water and oil and mm -hmm. um post color painting yeah anything else um pastel can also be something yeah anything else that's not two-dimensional art okay. performance sorry. Uh, sorry i didn't hear shika yes uh sculpture yeah somebody else said something else yeah i said clay maybe yeah yeah okay yeah uh so yeah uh medium of art is something that you use to create an artwork so the different dimension uh different mediums of art are uh, two-dimensional art like acrylics, watercolor, oil paints, um, photography, printmaking, and three-dimensional art uh, such as installation, sculptures, and performative art like dance, um, theater. Uh, so more recently also we see a lot of digital art. I've seen a lot on social media, for example. So um, what are the different places we see art in? Is it just limited to museums and exhibitions? Again, answers. I guess we see it everywhere, like even the houses in like, you know, cutleries and utensils. Yeah. For example, the blue and white, like this, those were the, the China one. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But... Yeah. Anywhere yeah, else? We see them on the walls uh, while we're traveling. Paintings. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, every everything that we see can be classified as a piece of art for me. If I look at my draperies uh, or even at my cutleries or even at my bags. Yeah. Bag. And then wouldn't you say there's a difference between something that we use just for a function, like, um, I don't know, a washing machine? Would you call that art also? No, if it is custom made according Yeah. That's true, yeah. I mean, I think anything. Talk, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Anything that, you know, maybe you for a creative expression. We have, you know, mm -hmm. art out of crap made sometimes. So, you yeah. know, something that involves creative expression and sort of mm -hmm. elicits aesthetic appeal from the viewer, that yeah. can be considered an art in that sense. Mm -hmm. So, I see these, you know, short of figures being made out of shrubbery in the park. So, mm -hmm. that I would consider art because it has something creative going in and it appeals yeah. to me in an aesthetic sense. Yeah, about that, I want to ask just like as a lead up question, what about the intent behind it? Does art have to have intent? As in, can you, like if I accidentally make something that looks good, is that also art? I mean, what do you think? Yes, ma'am, of course that would be. 
but when we want to convey something particularly then the intention matters a lot yeah okay yeah i mean i don't really have questions to the answers i mean answers to the questions i asked myself i was just i wanted to hear what you all think um so um okay in terms of places there are many different places where we can see art there are places of production of art um such as maybe places where textiles are produced uh, there are others where art is taught like art colleges then there are others where art is distributed like um, auction houses where they sell art or museums where it's put on display um and you know it's research is done on art so we also see it in our everyday lives like many of you said on the street uh, at metro stations maybe in shops um you know on calendars so um we can also see it in different fields of study so for example in history uh, an old painting or an old poster can be seen a, as a um, historical source since we can understand something about that time period um and the produc production of that artwork um from by looking at it as a historical source so um just to take from what we ended the last module with a work of art is entangled in a web of different places people and institutions so um it's linked to the artist of course and then um the art dealer is the one who is the bridge between the artist and people who want to buy it uh, there are art historians and scholars who research the work of art um and who research the artist sometimes looking at the social and cultural context um in which it was made and there are conservators or art restorers who conserve uh, works of art and um there are also museums and we often access art through museums uh is this part of the slide visible sorry um the complete right can someone please respond like where my cursor is now yeah okay yeah it is on the i think the chart slide the artwork art is conservated yeah okay uh so i just want to give an example of this um how an artwork can be part of many different places and fields and have a kind of life of its own so uh, an artwork was made um an artwork which was a sculpture of a woman it was made by an artist in the 3rd century it was later discovered by a river bank by someone who was passing by in that area in the 1900s so uh, then it was shown to a professor of history and he identified it as being this archaeological object with a lot of value and then it was later put in the local museum so many years passed after that and scholars realized that um, it was a very valuable piece of art and it tells us about the ancient period sorry could you mute your mic okay uh so yeah after that um, it became part of the national museum and it was recognized as a part of national history and so this artwork it goes from being a piece of art made by a particular artist or a group or maybe somebody commissioned it even and then it was part of an archaeological investigation and later historians and art historians study it further and it's part of governmental institutions like the state museum and the national museum and also international exhibitions So this is actually the true story of the Didar Ganj Yakshi uh, which is a sculpture and it's now in the Bihar Museum in Patna and um as you can tell in the story I well it's, it's not exactly a story it's true uh, but many of these participants um, who are part of this web they can use art for their own purposes um and in their own ways so a number of gov governmental institutions like national museums they use artwork for example to produce pasts so this is a term used by an art historian uh, to describe how when you're making a museum um, you are in a way creating a certain narrative about the past so depending on who's in power for example they can choose to remove certain artifacts or certain themes uh, if for example i create an art, uh, a museum which shows a timeline of indian history and i choose to remove all the modern artifacts from there and so the way art is then or the way the history of the country is then taught will exclude that part in some way and the public won't have access to it either because when they go to the museum it won't be there anymore so um 
this was just to explain this web. In the next part, um, I want to talk about three specific examples um, through which we can explore these mediums and categories of art. So um, Impressionism is the first one. It, uh, it's an art movement. So the term art movement is, uh, is used to describe the emergence of a certain type of art in a specific context. Sometimes this is in reaction to political events or um, in response to art that's prevalent at that time. Um, and putting works of art into these art movements is one way to categorize them and understand them better. So in European art history, uh, these movements follow a, a chronological kind of uh, progress from one to the next. Uh, however, when we actually look at the past, it's not such a neat kind of division where, you know, one movement comes and replaces another one. Uh, when we study art together, when we keep using these categories, it kind of makes it so concrete and neatly placed when it's actually not like that. For example, um, if a group of artists was creating art in India in the 1950s, and later in the 1980s, another group creates this similar looking art in a different place. Sometimes people, an art historian from today, for example, could look at them and say they're part of the same group, right? Uh, they're part of the same art movement. Um, so these art movements were originally um, you know, held centered around these exhibitions in Europe, and they help us understand the way that artists and authorities of art reacted to changing trends within art. So uh, there are also some defining features of each movement that um, help you to differentiate one from the other. So um, Impressionism is an art movement uh, which gets its name from um, the quite famous disparaging of one of Claude Monet's paintings. So this painting, Impression Sunrise, which you can see. So an art critic reacted to this painting and he said that it wasn't a complete picture, right? It was just an impression, a mere impressionism. So um, as you can tell from this painting, maybe, some of the defining characteristics of this movement are the visible brush strokes, uh, you know, making it apparent that this is just an impression. It's not um, that I'm trying to show a reality. Um, and Impressionism in most cases also looks, is focused on how paint is applied, how light and uh, color are shown uh, more than any other aspects in the picture. So um, in the last session, we did this exercise where for each picture we looked at, we were looking at it objectively. That is the elements of the picture, the uh, brush strokes, the colors, the shapes and so on, and subjectively. So your reactions to it. Uh, so let's just do that for some time, like a few seconds, maybe. Uh, just what do you think of the picture? Does it remind you of something? Or if you want to talk about the technical aspects of it. Yeah. This picture has many layers, I guess. And um, if you know, it's like a landscape, but they have tried to kind of show the reflection of the object in the water. Yeah. So, and, and because this is a drawing with many layers, we cannot see the, you know, the ships that easily rather than we can see the boat and the man. Like, it's more prominent yeah. than the other things. So maybe that's what What do you mean by many layers? My, uh, like, for example, we can see just many colors. First of all, it has been blended very, you know, it's it looks like it has been blended, but it's not very, you know, very smooth. It's not very smooth. It looks like it's done by a spatula. And um, then the layers in the sense, because there's a foreground, background, and background, like what we talked yeah. about last class. So like that. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Rajanya. Yes. So I think this is a picture of the Industrial Revolution when things were just about taking shape. So we cannot, uh, just as Anaya said, the wow. buildings like are not quite prominent and you have to really strain your eyes to see them. But the boat and the man are much better, only prominent. Yeah. Anyone else? I mean, again, it doesn't have to be a technical answer. It can be what you like about it. Do you like it? Anything like that. Uh, it has a very uh, soothing feeling, yeah. color of blue, yeah. more prominent. 
and uh, uh, it's a you know soothing effect basically calm a calm atmosphere keeping yeah. giving in the mind yeah i would say that as well yeah i think it's like the very light kind of you know pastel color it's it's very calm like you said like looking out at a scene like this it kind of looks foggy yeah it's yeah anyone else so i think the objects and the figures and the painting do not have a well defined boundaries they are yeah. sort of overlapping with the surroundings and that gives a sort of effect with oneness with the surroundings or something like that i guess mm. that's a really good observation actually because all the kind of strokes are the same but then like if you look at the boat at the bottom it's just those few prominent ones that tells you that it's this kind of water but everything kind of blends into each other but at the same time it doesn't yeah that is a really good observation thank you and anyone else and the painting be a bit of monochrome because there's so many shades of blue which is mm -hmm. which is blending and yeah, i think yeah. the picture was of a rainy day or maybe a day after rain or a storm because it's very foggy and you can't yeah, really yeah. see anything that way well. the prominence yeah. of the sun too yeah even in that calmness you have the you know the bright i mean to be brighter yeah and i think it just draws your eye to that place and that the reflection as well so you just go from that spot downwards yeah there's a comment on chat uh, angel by oh, okay. yeah kesha yeah uh, on intention intentional that fantasy. was when you we were talking about intention for okay. that i Hmm. Yeah, I haven't read it very carefully, but then I was also thinking. I mean, for historical characters or people, I don't know. You know, we can never fully get at somebody's intention. We can only, you know, wonder now. And like when we're looking at older paintings, for example, I think yeah, it's it kind of leaves a lot open for interpret interpretation. But then. a lot of people kind of make conclusive comments about art that's what i see sometimes you know this is exactly what somebody meant to say through this but then i think we can't actually ever reach the intention of an artwork i mean unless there's some recorded you know sort of thing where somebody's saying exactly why they did something um so let's move on to the next slide uh just a bit okay yeah So in this slide you can see three artworks by artists uh, who took part in this art movement. So again um let's just pause and look at them. Um so you can again you can respond to this what are the differences you see between them? Um they're all from the same art movement but they look quite different visually. So yeah. If anyone wants to respond or we can just quietly the look at the painting style is quite the same. Oh, okay. the, the small strokes I was actually going to say it I think the the brush strokes especially are quite different. So for the first one you know you have these kind of vertical brush strokes even though it's I don't know everything seems to be kind of dragging down a bit and then the second one is just like a lot of movement like you really you need to look carefully to tell what what is shown in the picture because there's all of these kind of swirling brush strokes and the last one is a little more dab kind of thing it's not I think it's a little more defined also you can see the outlines kind of the drawing on the dress and so on Any other responses Um can I say something Yeah 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 uh, so I was thinking the they got to the right dancers in blue even though the like each of the girls looks different I feel like that's not important at all 
because i mean maybe the fact maybe maybe that they are in blue or the kind of mood the whole thing evokes seems more important than how each individual dancer looks or even yeah. what each individual dancer is doing mm. yeah uh, maybe something about the uh, and motion not sure mm. yeah um for me i guess the first picture it's sort of blurry it's like somebody who cannot see properly and he has taken the specs off so uh, it's like that the second one is like uh from a car when you're moving and you're just seeing things in a motion blur like yeah. it's, it's blurry too but in in a different kind of way and another thing which i think is that the first uh, picture even though the colors that are used in it is they're like dark blue the picture yeah. gives you a sense of light in it like this is a bright mm -hmm. picture but mm -hmm. uh, when we see uh, the third picture even though the colors are like green is used light blue is used it's sort of a dull if you look at it on like yeah. first glance i guess so, and it's it's very still compared to them yeah that's true yeah i was thinking that too. wait did somebody say something or was that my own voice echoing back to me I was going to say something. Your okay. voice is echoing. I think all the paintings have something like different. Like for the first painting, it's kind of like a landscape. It's mm -hmm. maybe a is it like maybe a city or something. The yeah. second thing is a vase, and then the third painting is a they have figures in it. So mm -hmm. I think that's something different in all the paintings. Yeah. I think that mood point was really interesting. Like. Now that I'm looking at the second one, especially, it's so dull. It's, I mean, you wouldn't think it's a picture of flowers. I mean, when you think about other still lives with flowers, they're, you know, again, with all the movement, you can't exactly tell. I didn't even know it was flowers when I first saw it. I mean, because of the name, I was like, okay, it's flowers. But yeah. Did someone say something? Yeah. May I add something too? This yeah. Is yeah. My my impression because see uh, looking at uh, you know artists today who have the uh, you know they can capture something more accurate but for, yeah, for the impressionist artist uh, for him or her to recall uh, uh, you know what uh, one had seen would be through his inner eye so in that sense is it is that the reason why such uh, the artwork that you're sharing is called impressionist what do you mean by the inner eye? As in, you know, you would, if you've been down, you know, like that, uh, uh, the sun, sunrise scene uh, would have been experienced by the artist, but, you know, he wouldn't have been, uh, you know, even if you were to cover it live, the colors and texture and the lights keep changing. Yeah. Whereas today you can actually capture it through technology and get the exact moment. Whereas, yeah. uh, you know, for them to, uh, you know, later recall, visualize, and bring out a piece of art. Would it yeah. have a kind of a subjective element? Because the moment is gone, and you're sitting and you know, mm -hmm. uh, call it, painting it through memory. Yeah. So is is that one of the uh, ideas, uh, or which is why they are called impressionist? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a good point because, like you said, a lot of them did paint, um, and they called it in on play, plain air, like out in the open. Um, so they would be looking at these places and painting, or you know, they would quickly kind of get a sense of it or a sketch and then go complete it in their studios. So mm -hmm. yeah, like you said, it is because of that. But I think also, like when you look at the historical context, it's mm -hmm. about they were their work was initially rejected in a lot of these exhibitions because it wasn't, you know, according to the realistic standards of painting that were there at that time. So I think it's also like a reaction or like a challenge to the kind of art that was prominent at that time. So again, there's like a lot of things. There's what you said, and then there's the art at the time. I think a lot is also just experimentation. Um, like you can see all of their work is quite different. I mean, it has similarities, but then they're all just experimenting, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Actually, on that note, um, in this slide, I've put three works by uh, Berth Morissette, who is called an Impressionist. So um, 
now that you know some of the features of impressionism, um, would you call all three of these impressionistic? Or like, how would you categorize them? Anyone? Um, the one with the baby, I think, uh, like the scribbles and all, it definitely re refers to a baby. But in the last one, it's much more sophisticated and has much more details than the one because it's too grown up, so yes. And the middle one, I think, is kind of a teenage look. Mm. Oh, I didn't actually notice this. But yeah, I mean, I, I think I wasn't looking at the subject then, like, um, I mean, I was thinking, so I think as the dates show, it's a kind of progression through her artistic style as well. So the first one is a watercolor painting, and it's kind of realistic. Um, the second one is a lot more, imp quite impressionistic, I'd say. The wall, for example, is this, you can tell there's something there, but then you don't know what exactly. Um, and then the third one, I think, is kind of a hybrid because you can see kind of outlines of shapes, the arms, for example, or the figures. But then again, the plants and so on are quite impressionistic. So it's like she's kind of come to a hybrid over time, maybe. Um, yeah. Any other comments? So uh, what would be the relics, uh, the impressionist elements that you would describe? I mean, they're all classified, declassified, but uh, for a person who is being introduced to appreciation of impressionism, so what should be the uh, markers to classify them as impressionist? Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at the second one, for example, um, I'd say, you know, of course, the brush strokes, you don't really get a real sense of what is being shown. Even if you look at the skirt in the second one, it's not very clear, but because of where it is and so on, you can tell what it is. Um, so the brush strokes that are, they're very visible, but then they don't give you a real sense of what they're showing. Um, and then the colors, mm -hmm. a lot of them do use bright colors, I think, because it was because of that sort of live painting of nature. It was nature most of the time. Um, and also, sometimes if you look at the canvases themselves, you can see the paint application very clearly. So sometimes, um, you know, paint kind of comes off the surface if it's quite thick, apply, uh, thickly applied. Um, so yeah, I think, but the visible brush strokes are the most kind of prominent part of uh, Impressionism. Mm -hmm. Which are short strokes, are they? Yeah, short strokes. And yeah, it's not, you know, blended in with everything else. The way normally blending happens in, like if you do a pencil blending, you know, from dark to light, it'll be much smoother. Uh, but here, like this, there's an effort to show the strokes themselves. Uh, so as you can see in these examples, I hope, um, when we look at different artworks from the same movement or the same artist, it's not always clear which category an artwork belongs to. So there are some art, artists or artworks that don't fit into any of these categories, any of these art movements, and many of them actually fit into many at the same time. So um, to end this example, I actually want to make a point about art movements. Uh, I think it's a useful tool for us to work with. So we can categorize artwork into movements to help us understand them better, to compare them um, to other artworks. Um, and it also gives us an interesting way of thinking about the world and how to make art. So for example, you can work with a completely different material or a different medium, uh, even probably dance or music. Um, and you could still get, yeah, sorry, um, there's a hand. Shavuni. Am I audible? Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm sure yeah, here. Can. Yeah. Okay. Now I just wanted to know. Uh, you are saying that uh, uh, that they can be. You know, uh, it doesn't have to fit into a certain category. But you have shown these as part of an impressionist. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, an artist who's an impressionist artist then how do you categorize them so clearly that they are part of that particular that's what i wanted to know that on the one hand you are saying that you know it could be that it is a per person's uh, interpretation but on the other hand you are categorizing them as part of an impressionistic a work of an impressionistic artist how do you do both of them how can they both yeah. be working at the same time so yeah with this slide in particular i wanted to bring into question that you know an artist who's called an impressionist so can we actually i mean that's kind of the point i was trying to make can we actually say that somebody is an impressionist or somebody if fits into this category when you can see this progression through her life where her um, art style is changing and the final work is not even an impressionistic picture as a whole right it's kind of a hybrid so that's kind of the point i was making we can't always fit people into these categories we can't clearly say that they fit into one or you know i mean yeah so that was kind of the point i was making um i don't know was that a clear answer yeah thank you okay uh so yeah like i was saying um it you can work with a completely different material and still get something impressionistic so um here for example i've taken small square pieces of paper that i kind of scribbled on and i've put it together in a way that gives you an impression of a wave and mountains in the back i don't know if that was as clear but um it doesn't properly show you something but it just suggests to you the structures and the colors that are there in the scene so um the point i was making with this is that the essence of impressionism can be used in other mediums of art as well um or performative art and uh, music also um excuse me may yeah. i ask a question yeah. uh, wh what was the reason behind this uh, impressionistic i mean why would anybody not want to be absolutely clear about what he or she is wanting to depict why would it be left to somebody's imagination or you know interpretation to interpret the way you want to why could it, was there a reason because of which was it that they they were uh, scared of uh, sort of you know putting something into almost like literally like a black and white uh, but rather lay, you know make keep it gray so that you know people are uh, are free to uh, interpret it the way they want to was it deliberate or was it uh, uh, something which was unintentional and it just uh, came about what was the reason behind this uh, impressionistic uh, art form or artwork mm, so i don't know if i can answer that completely uh, i think it i i'm assuming it came out kind of just from experimenting with how you can make art and and then they found that they were creating something that's quite different to what was popular at that time which like i said was a lot of realistic art right but then again i'm thinking um, around this time or a little before this um the camera was introduced so there's this medium where you can create you know you can accurately uh, capture a scene so maybe i don't know that this connection is there for sure but i'm just thinking out loud maybe it's also something to do with you know we have this medium to create something realistic so let's branch out into how else can we create art you know what is art what will be the difference between art and photography then if my art is realistic and my photograph is capturing something accurately as well i don't know maybe it's something like that i i can't really conclusively say the reason and um, something to it so yeah um, uh, i was thinking that usually uh, when no matter which category of art we are doing people really want to explore something because that's the main motive of art the freedom uh, exploring new things uh, breaking out of uh, radical and oppressive ideas that are created by artists before you so couldn't it be this uh, would be like as you mentioned it's it's a new moment and every new moment uh, is witnessed with some backlash so that would make it a revolution so it was an attempt to break free from that chain of uh, oppressive orthodox things of art that were mm -hmm. normalized um, yeah some just, yeah yeah no i was just thinking if someone asked you about why this method right and i like i don't have much of an orientation into art history but regarding monet i remember reading something uh I don't remember the name of the book. If I remember it, I'll put it in chat. But 
regarding Monet specifically, I remember there was this thing about wanting to depict specific things in nature, like light better. And that realistic style of painting wasn't quite cutting it. And that he wanted to try how, you know, uh, try and see how uh, you could depict a, a scene of nature with the impact of light falling on it because he didn't put realistic and quite captured uh, yeah, light on nature. Mm. That's something I vaguely recall. And, uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I remember the book I shared, but thank you. Yeah. There was someone else who wanted to say something? Yes, I was going to uh, respond to the question as well that in one of the schools that I was teaching, we were giving children this uh, not the term impressionism of art, but we were trying to give them a picture that, you know, nature in itself is not symmetrical and doesn't have lines, but yeah. it's us creating those lines. But but if you see a tree from close, it's, it's submerging into the space. So also the impressionism uh, art form, art movement actually came in order to get away from uh, always painting mythic creatures and hist historical uh, figures and everything because I think before that they were always doing king's portraits and so on so they wanted to go more into uh, nature and landscapes and more contemporary life in general yeah yeah there's one more person Kesha yeah. Uh, the point that you brought up about camera and impressionistic painting, I wanted to add to that. So when you look at a picture from camera, it's like really well-defined, realist sort of picture. And impressionistic painting sort of uh, gives way to, I think, human agency of creative vision, if I put it that way. So yeah. a camera as a machine would put out a picture as a machine with nothing yeah. creative in it. But an impressionistic painting that is sort of painted in this manner is a way to show a human agency that is not possible for a machine. A mm -hmm. camera cannot make such a painting that is blurry with such brush yeah. strokes and color schemes. So in a way, it's sort of, you know, I would think of it as, you know, human agency that machine could not have a sort of creative vision sort of thing. Yeah. I actually, I wanted to respond to the person who was talking about symmetry and so on. I think something I just thought of now was also um, that a lot of realistic art before this in European art history is not, it's not just, it kind of represents something else as well. So, you know, this whole kind of coming of, uh, we talked about this last time, but for those who aren't there, we talked about the coming of modernity. So where everything is very scientific and rational. So, you know, um, everything has to be accurately depicted. So we need to show everything with perspective and um, the correct way of, you know, light and shadow and so on. But then I think this can also be seen then as a reaction to that where we, maybe something about how art does not fit into these kind of scientific and rational ways of thinking you know it doesn't have to be so accurate or it i don't know i was thinking of it as a reaction to that um if anyone has wants to know more about that about modernity i can refer to you I refer you to something uh, just ask at the end of the session if there's something related to that um so i just want to move on to the next um second example we're going to take so this is a uh, banner and cut out artists in tamil nadu and I'm taking this from the work of Dr. Praminda Jacob. Um, she's written this book called Celluloid, Celluloid Deities, The Visual Culture of Cinema and Politics in South India. So uh, in the book, she looks at hand-painted banners and cutouts in Chennai, uh, in South India. So these came up between 1950s and 2000s, after which they were replaced by mechanically produced banners and cutouts on vinyl, um, so the material vinyl. Um, so she looks at how this advertising uh, medium was central to the fusion of the Tamil cin cinema industry and Tamil nationalism. So it's a coming together of uh, cinema and politics through this medium. And in the book, she conducts these interviews with 
people who are involved with this Anna industry. So um, uh, the artists, the people who uh, were between the filmmakers and the artists and so on. So um, in this section, we're looking at a particular medium that is the banners and some uh, categories that I'm going to highlight later. So her book also, also shows us how this artwork is uh, part of different fields. So it's a part of understanding politics in Tamil Nadu and the film industry. And along with that, um, it's also understanding society because it's an, uh, an ethnographic uh, work. And so she's understanding society through this group of people and the economy around banner industry. So uh, this is the background of the book. And in the next part, I just want everyone to take some time to look at these pictures. Um, and specifically, I want to just uh, ask a few questions. And this is just a guessing kind of exercise. Um, so this is about the process of creating a banner. Uh, what do you think you would have to keep in mind when you're creating a banner? So as you can see, they're quite huge and they're on roadsides. You still see these, but these they're now mechanically produced. And I know at least like I've stayed in Kerala for long. They're always there whenever a new film is coming out, for example, or political rallies and so on. Um, so yeah, it's something that's, you know, huge. It's supposed to draw attention. What would you have to keep in mind when you're creating a banner? It should be very attractive. The focus is on, sorry. Yeah. Uh, may I? Yeah, yeah. The focus is not on the entire uh, banner per se, but on a specific thing that you want the uh, the general public to look at. So the first one, uh, uh, you know, it has a very, a lot of uh, gory details on the person's, uh, you know, face and bright colors and against yeah. uh, against a not so bright background. And mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at the banner, I mean, that is where your attention is automatically drawn in. Uh, mm -hmm. Similarly, in the second one, in spite of so many figures in the backdrop, in the foreground, whatever is written in that orange, uh, that that invariably draws more attention than uh, everything else in the background. So I, I guess that is something one has to uh, keep in mind that whatever you are trying to draw attention to of the public, that is uh, prominent enough. But the others are just adding to the story. They are important, but maybe not as important as uh, the the focus area where you know you, where your uh, sort of uh, uh, your uh, the glasses, you know, where you want to really, uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, what do you call it? Um, the lens where through which you want to see, you know, focusing on, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's what I think a uh, uh, banner generally does. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to add to that before the two hands, the cutouts also kind of serve that purpose. As you can see, this is kind of standing above the actual banner. So it's something that really pops out to you quite literally. Um, the other, uh, Pavitra, uh, you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. So while looking at a banner, people don't really tend to see at the smallest of details, like the writings or mm -hmm. something. So they just want a glance at the, at the whole picture. So if you see both the banners, you see big figures. Uh, actually trying to depict the whole thing, the movie or whatever, the advertising medium that they want to do it. Yeah. So also, uh, these all these uh, pictures don't fit inside a perfect shape. If you see the man is protruding out of the yeah. rectangle banner itself, the woman is also, the letters, the Tamil letters are also protruding out. So they, they seem to draw attention to the people who actually want to see it. So... Yeah. Also, the colors are also vibrant here. That was a really good point about uh, how it stands out. So it's not just, you know, one shape that you see. Because of what's up and down, you're really drawn to that immediately. Uh, Sanaya? Yeah, I think that banner should not be plain. Because if it's plain, the people will find it boring and they will not look at it. And we can, this, like, this is a very good example. Like, in the first picture, there's an explosion behind the man. So when a person is seeing it, they will like, you know, think about it. Like what is the story maybe of the movie or whatever is coming out. Even in the second picture, there are so many people behind it. And maybe, and like they're fighting or doing something. So that's, you know, giving a story behind it. And people actually are looking at it for a long time. So that's one point. Uh, Sarita? 
Yeah, I feel just one thing connected to what Sanaya has already said. Uh, it's uh, the trailer in Still. Mm, yeah. The trailer of a movie in Still. So it's like whatever you wish to portray or express to the audience, mm. uh, it is done through this. So it has to be very powerful. The mm. meaning and the idea should be presented in such an attractive manner. So it's like a trailer in a still manner. Yeah. Have and you still? Thing, yeah. Uh, another thing, uh, a banner is generally meant for the uh, proletariat, for the you know rustic, the ordinary people. It doesn't have to have anything which is very fine, which needs to be looked into with a magnifying glass. You know, it should be there on your face. It is as it is as it is that you find. There's nothing. There's no uh, hidden agenda behind a particular uh, particular banner. It is saying what it is wants to. It wants to say, and it it must immediately and and it since they are on the roadside, nobody has so much of a time to actually. I mean, it is presumed that you know when you are traveling, you would just have a glance and immediately it must sort of uh, give you the message that it wants to. So it mm -hmm. is more for the the general public rather than for a certain kind of public. So. I don't know. I'm not sure whether I'm right in using the word proletariat. It could be for anybody, but yeah, it is meant for the general, uh, the masses, you know, too. So therefore, yeah. it has to have those uh, those larger than life uh, kind of, you know, whether it's the use of the colors or the cutouts or the way it is yeah. made. It must sort of identify. We must uh, identify with the things that are being shown, especially the figures. It should yeah. be identifiable. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking uh, so they are larger than life. Yeah. 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 No, I was just thinking when everyone was talking. Um, I don't actually know if the banners today look like this because, um, in my recent memory in Kerala, for example, a lot of them are now just faces of the actors. Like you know, one larger, like the protagonist will be the biggest, and then other people in the background. So when someone's talking about um a trailer and still, I don't actually know now that do they. I mean, in your experience, um. Yeah, do they it, still look like that? They do have, but not in 3D like. Like, you know, here yeah. it doesn't reflect this kind of. Uh, many a times you find those uh, posters of movies uh, on, the, on the walls, uh, but with having, you know, a minimal amount, all the, I mean, uh, actors, actresses, everything is depicted actually. So, and in, in a small stretch of uh, road, you find them frequently. So even if you're not a regular movie goer, goer, you would still want to, you know, find out what what is the movie about. So mm -hmm. that kind of advertising is very much there, but not mm -hmm. this kind of a, you know, three D uh, impact. Mm -hmm. I have no yeah. Also, I think yeah. the faces really get established. Sorry, I I don't have a hand raising thing because of the pose. Oh no, no, it's yeah, okay. So Go ahead, I think yeah. the faces really get like make a strong impression on people so it, especially yeah. if these actors are already well known mm -hmm. and i can imagine i like i don't know the one on the right the mustached guy looks like chiranjeevi i'm not sure but it could be chiranjeevi uh and yeah so i think like if you already know these actors mm -hmm. or you see them in the papers and then you're going on the street like i think it would be really well embedded in your head that mm -hmm. there is this movie out and, you know this is yeah. these are all the things that it promises the whatever the dramatic scenes that are depicted yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I this one is, yeah. There are, there are also political party banners. They may not look as dramatic, but you also have pictures of, you know, uh, very well known. Tamil Nadu, especially Tamil Nadu. Yeah. 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 Even in Maharashtra, even in Maharashtra, yeah. you see them in, in you know, in uh, the Chorahas or the, you know, the signals, traffic signals. You see one huge banner on one side. Uh, it yeah. almost kind of covers everything, all buildings and everything that is behind it. Yeah, it, it's quite visible. But yeah, political banners are, uh, are much more visible these days than probably, at least in Maharashtra, probably, um, uh, you know, the actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so, okay, the next question is a little more technical. Uh, again, this is a guessing question. So how do you think they transferred uh, this? So if you create a composition for a film banner, how do you make it so big because they did it by hand right so how do you transfer a small sketch to the banner do you think it's directly painted on or is it in parts uh, any guesses 
it certainly in parts because i have seen one being removed so i saw part of the so it is uh, so that's how i know that it's not in uh, it's not the entire figure being put there part of it is taken out and before they actually put put something else on that stand so it it's taken out in parts but i don't know how they kind of get the parts you know aligned to each other so well i i don't know that that how do they prepare it be beforehand i know how they put it but how do they prepare it beforehand i have no idea yeah. i think there's a bit of mathematics involved in this in terms of uh, proportion and scale mm -hmm. uh, and so if you are contracting an image or expanding an image like they traditionally did in terms of drafting maps and stuff mm -hmm. where, you know there would be a scale a proportion and scale to which it would be magnified yeah. so if this has got a technology in a computer backup so which is easy because you can mm -hmm. actually magnify the scale but you, i think your question is how do they actually create it in terms of the print is it no 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 as in it was just a question about thinking about the process so how did they transfer a small sketch to this scale um so i mean it's anything just guessing so you know did they take a big ladder and then start from top and paint paint or yeah what do you think anyone else okay i'm going to assume that's a no uh, so here are some pictures of parts of the process so um, the head artist first takes um, the important scenes and uh, uses stills from them to create a composition or the film company gives them the important scenes and usually they also refer to this kind of catalog they have of older films older banners right so they have it's kind of this repeated sense of the composition again and again uh, in every new banner and then um, they put it on a glass plate and they project it um, onto the banner and then they divide it into parts and then the apprentices or other artists they start painting it in parts um, and then this is just a picture of somebody painting um, so yeah it was just about thinking about the process there's no real conclusion to this uh, the next so um, another category I want to talk about in art history is the difference between artist and artisan so uh, I'm just going to go into the history a little uh, to give some background of what I know about this um, so in the 18th century, with the establishment of European-run arts of school, uh, schools of art, sorry, uh, the term artist was used to differentiate those who are formally trained in these schools and artisan communities who are local painters, printmakers, sculptors, uh, who are initially caste communities, but then they be uh, this became much more flexible. So um, when the curriculum in, in these art schools started becoming much more hybridized as time went on, and so these groups were kind of somewhere in the middle um, of artist, artist and artisan. So in the book, for example, which I'm referring to, um, the artists here, they kind of talk about this ambivalence uh, about their position as either artists or artisans. Um, and another point I wanted to make was about uh, the status of an artwork. Uh, so the way the status of an artwork and the way that it's defined in this context is very different from uh, European art history. So um, in European art history, the art object is a direct link to the artist. And that's where a lot of its value lies. So, um, you know, artworks in international museums, for example, they're protected, they're very expensive, not only because of the value of the artwork itself, but because it links us to that artist. Um, and um, in the case of the banner artist, however, the artwork was not directly, you know, linked to their artistic identity. Um, this is because the banners were often recycled, uh, they were disposed, they were, most of the time there were no photographs of the banners after they had made them. Um, and um, as opposed to this, a lot of famous European art, it remains in a single museum for generations, and it's visited, you know, almost every day and photographed. Um, and these banners could be made, you know, in a day, and they were put up from three days to a month, so it's not a very long period of time. And they would also be put up overnight. So they seem to kind of magically appear and disappear around the city overnight. Um, and this kind of give, gave the people the sense that, you know, these were actually me mechanically produced banners. But in reality, there's a lot of labor and uh, energy that went into this process, as you can imagine. So um, 
today we still use these categories in our daily lives. Um, and I just wanted to show how it can, it comes from this colonial category. Uh, in the next part, if anyone has any responses to this part, also, if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate. Um, we're all just talking and learning. So, yeah. I just had a question with regard to the labor. So sometimes when you see banners, they are not specifically painted or handmade. Sometimes they are just printed. For example, you see more realistic computer or yeah. created uh, banners. So how could they be made uh, in such a big form maybe? Sorry, I didn't understand quite. Uh, how could they be made? Yeah, so um, they, they look a little more detailed. They don't look handmade. Like one here, they look uh, a bit painted, painted by people. But yeah. the the realistic advertisement banners that you see, there are people, uh, yeah. it's more like digital art, art, right? So is there any way in which they could be created? How are they created? Yeah, how okay. are they I mean, I don't know the details of the process, but I know now people print these out um, and they create them on computers. So it's digitally, they make the compositions on um, a laptop or a computer, for example, and then they print them out. So I think I'm not exactly sure, uh, but I'm sure there are printers which print, you know, large, very large posters and artworks. So, yes, yeah. you're right, Angel. They are all printed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so the next um, example we're going to talk about um, of a medium of art. Yeah. Uh, so this is public art and public art is usually any art that's created in a public space or um, that anyone can access, right? So um, this can be murals. Um, people mentioned these earlier. These are painted onto walls uh, on in public spaces or installations, which are any sort of construction that can be made out of any medium really. Um, so for example, a large sculpture. I uh, just thought of some, yeah. I, I just wanted to know, you know, there are these public parks where they create out of the uh, plants that they have grown. They give them a certain mm -hmm. shape of an animal or a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever. I mean, some, some kind of a shape of and generally animals only, but there could be other shapes also. What uh, that would also come under public art, and how would you categorize them? You know, they'll keep trimming the plants at a certain mm -hmm. time to ensure that it retains the shape, right? They are yeah. done with a lot of wiring and all that to ensure wiring or some kind of rods to ensure that they re remain in shape, and they keep pruning mm -hmm. the plants uh, from time to time. That mm -hmm. is, those are also artistic. I mean, uh, in some yeah. places, they, uh, and they, they, you know, put the light, especially at night, in certain spaces, such that the a light mm -hmm. focuses on that artwork itself. Mm -hmm. The it is not meant for the rest of the park. So they they would also be categorized as uh, uh, art in public space. I would say so. I don't know of any formal sort of category. I know that ornamental ga gardening, um, so creating these kind of decorative pieces out of plants and flowers, is a kind of field of its own. Um, but then, yeah, I would think of them as. I'm, yeah, this is an interesting question because I'm not quite sure. Um, they're not talked of as art. I, I mean, I think they're art because... Because there's I mean, a lot of creativity that goes yeah, in, you know, before that's true, yeah. it can be formalized in the mind and then put into, uh, you know, uh, implemented yeah. on the ground. So there yeah. is a lot of planning that goes in, probably much more than probably some of the posters because now we've got used to these youth side posters and there is a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you've done it before you probably have to tweak it a little to make it appear a little different. But when it comes to individually, each one of these, uh, you know, uh, work ornamental gardens, as you said, uh, in the form of an animal or whatever that you are putting up, it requires a lot of, uh, depending upon space and how much, yeah. how big it can be, or, you know, how often yeah. can you trim it, what kind of plantation it is. Yeah. It does require a lot of creativity. So I, that's why I was asking, is it, uh, would it be categorized as art in public space? 
I am not sure about the category itself. And I mean, I think the point of this is also to call into question, you know, who categorizes these things and should we really follow these categorizations? Um, so, I mean, it's a, something to think about, but like you said, a lot of work goes into it and a lot of thinking. Uh, I've seen this thing, I can't remember. It's, it's a show on ornamental gardening, gardening, sorry. So, and they actually show a lot of, you know, you need to think about the plant species. So some that attract insects, uh, would you use that kind of uh, plant? Some that, uh, you know, decay easily. So that, like you said, there's a lot of creativity and planning that goes into this. So I would call it public art, but then, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, so um, yeah, the question I wanted to ask to start off this uh, section is, what would you need to keep in mind when creating art in a public space where there's a lot of continuous activity and people can interact with it in whatever way that they want, right? So any um, starting kind of answers to this? Yeah, go ahead, Sanaya. I think that when a, an artwork is going to be put on a public space, people should not, the artist should not put anything that can offend anyone because then the whole, you know, painting can go down and then there'll be a lot of controversy for the painting and we have seen this also I guess so maybe mm -hmm. we should not put anything that can offend someone or that is against some religion or something so that should be kept in mind that discrimination based artwork should not be put in public because everybody is going to see it yeah I okay I think I have a follow up I mean not uh, if I may add to this yeah yeah, yeah. So I would like to disagree with what uh, the previous speaker said. A lot of public art mm. actually is offensive. Yeah. If you see on the walls out there, it is actually offensive. You know, if you look at the art that is, uh, you know, painted or published by political parties, it's often targeting the other side. And even if you look at art in the art artistic and graffiti, for example, so we said that it should be offensive because art is a form of showing dissent and even protest for that matter is offensive and at times it can also be discriminatory and you know people have used art for propaganda you know the zionist movement the nazis for example nazis use a lot of art for you know using uh, for throwing out their propaganda so one cannot have this, you know, watertight compartment where art cannot be discriminatory or offensive. Of course, it can. Yeah, I kind of agree with that because I'd say that, uh, you know, it's also a question of what you term um, to be appropriate for a public space, right? So something, I don't know. But then I think also the good thing about public art is that everybody has a right to it in some way everybody has access to that space so um i just remember this artist i mean it's somebody that i just follow on instagram i don't know much about them but basically he does uh, graffiti but he covers up homophobic and anti-semitic uh, graffiti so it's again i mean i think it just makes us think about how we define you know what is yeah. appropriate you know what would be offensive or in some ways I also think wall graffiti, that the wall mm -hmm. graffiti we see and suddenly see a lot of it coming up bang before the uh, before an election especially in India in some of the states not necessarily everywhere but mm -hmm. uh, it certainly does come up in West Bengal I've seen that uh, yeah there is there could be a lot of artwork besides all the writing that goes in who decides whether it ought to be there that it is there in fact in fact it is also there in the outer walls of many private buildings and i'm not sure whether any kind of permission has been sought before it has been put up so yeah it could be temporary just the bank before the election but it is yeah. sort of you know disfiguring somebody's wall for you it might be uh, for you as in from i mean not personally you for yeah. a lot of us it could be um, uh, artwork but for somebody to whom this particular uh, you know who resides in that uh, th that uh, residence it could be uh, disfiguring of his wall so where do you draw the line which is what is public art art and what is not and also sometimes the public art can be actually uh, creating problems of mobility you know they might be put up at a place where it is not possible for 
everyone to be able to kind of you know have their normal mobility around those areas you are actually restricting mobility in some way for example a poster or something you know a banner for example in in, in front of a uh, you know double storied building if you put a banner you are actually uh, sort of stopping my visibility uh, you know across uh, whatever it it is uh so you, you really uh, how do we define then is it acceptable because at the end of the day it is public space so that whoever has put up that uh, that banner is well within his or her rights but then what happens to my visibility that mm. place, space in front of my house is my space it cannot be blocked by yeah. a, supposed to be public art then where does one draw the line i mean in both cases the graffiti and this uh, particular uh, thing that i just gave an example of yeah. Can I say something? Yeah, Can yeah, we? go ahead. Uh, I what I try to say was that, like for example, that that I I follow impact in many of these social activist groups on Instagram, and they're like they post many you know artworks which is protest which is protesting for the rights for maybe maybe like feminism or the LGBTQ community, and that is needed because we need to protest for these important topics, and we need to get the word out there that you know we need our rights. So for that, I guess it's not offensive because it's the correct thing. I guess you know, but maybe it can be best uh, offensive for people for homophobic people maybe. Yeah. So, but we need that because that's the correct thing. I just like what I meant that example. It's a movie poster, and they're writing something wrong about the religion, or maybe something wrong about the people in the portrayed. Maybe wrong information. so that's why i guess that researching before doing the art on the topic is very important that's what i thought i wanted to like you know say i mean i just want to add uh, it's sorry one sec it's um it's a question of perspective again right so when you say it's correct somebody else might not think that it's correct or yeah and like the movies some movies that were made in india were like banned in pakistan because they did not like the content so that's relevant yeah uh somebody else was going to say something um and yeah i wanted to give example of university campuses and public art in the university campus and probably prominently i would like to give example of jnu because that campus has a lot of public art on the wall so if you look at you know public art on jnu campus it's sort of a campus that reflects public art in sort of battle of ideologies for in so you have art by a student organization like isa and then abbp nsui so also public art in that sense also reflects ideology to a certain extent political ideology social ideology and it can be offensive in the sense that i'm trying to say is for example you know left the art that is oriented toward right can uh, certainly be offensive toward uh, for a right leaning person for example in jnu campus they challenge a lot of you know religious customs and again the whole you know fiasco that has happened in jnu for the last few years is because of that public art and public performance public performance protest so yes our offensive a matter of public how should i put it controversy that i didn't get what you said last sorry um whether art is offensive is a matter and a matter of public controversy you know it is sparking some sort of controversy so you know an art cannot be politically correct i mean i certainly think so art cannot be politically correct because again it is going to hurt some sentiments so we cannot say that make and especially public art because it's going to hurt someone and people are going to our religion is hurt by this yeah uh tanu your hand is raised uh yeah am i audible yeah sure yeah so i just have one point to say that uh, like if you ask me i'm completely novice in this particular uh, field but yes uh, how i look at it is that uh, if you enjoy a permanent lack like what i feel is the lack in the sense can also be a way to contextualize art and that lack can be in the uh, the idea of a image versus the idea of the text that is the language that you're using or the amount of words you're putting in a 
particular photograph or whatever you're using or graffiti or whatever. So I think the idea or this gap itself, this lack between the image as well as the text can also be left left or uh, towards the public to decipher what it is actually it is saying because that lack and that chaos also i i feel somehow internally people enjoy they don't want to really conclude things just the moment they look at it and it's really good that people keep on wondering about it so i think the amazement of a public art can also be tapped by keeping this lack maintained between the chaotic uh, idea of uh, image versus a text you know that you're yeah. using yeah, on this note i just remembered um so this is um artwork by Marcel Duchamp the the fountain it's quite famous it's a urinal but it's called the fountain and when you talked about that the dissonance between the text and the image that's what I was thinking about because he calls it a fountain but then it's a urinal so <laughs> yeah you know yeah. but people still refer to it as the fountain so there's that um that you know kind of a question oh, of yeah, the multiplicity of the yeah, yeah the the image you know and it's it's yeah. something i think people will like uh, generally in research they say that you know like i got a uh, i got a good feedback in my phd uh, thesis viva and then there my examiner in fact the coordinator of my examiner like my uh, viva she was the one who told me that you you need to leave certain things you know just like just leave them unanswered as well let the others explore those possibilities so i think art the way that you're talking about the public art should leave possibilities for others to think about, delve, you know, even work yeah. on something that you have worked, you know, to probably to improvise it in, in a better way. I would yeah. take it like that. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really good point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so this is on the same note. Um, I mean, just again, a guessing question. Wait, is there anybody else who wants to say something? Okay. Um, so suppose this piece of art was near, you know, on a piece of land near the sea, what would you have to keep in mind in that case? Uh, so in this slide, I've taken this example of a sculpture, uh, the yellow pumpkin by Yayoi Kus Kusama. Um, and it was near the sea on this Japanese island called Naoshima. Uh, it was recently displaced by a typhoon at, at, at the start of August, if I'm not wrong. And um, yeah, I was just, I mean, there's no particular reason why I chose this. I like the I like how it looks uh, actually in this image in particular. But yeah, just the question. Um, just to think about a specific example, if it was by the sea, what would you have to keep in mind, or what kind of theme could you think about? Uh, for example, I was thinking about how we can make something that's maybe um, biodegradable or dissolves in water. So you know if there's something there and then the waves keep coming as the waves come the what the art piece uh, keeps changing because it's dissolving slowly um and it also tells you about time i guess uh, but yeah that's just an example um what would you have to keep in mind or any anything you can think of on this on these these lines yeah uh, it just shows how be... all of us are mere mortals our creations and everything <laughs> i yeah hmm. <laughs> Like, you know, the uh, times of, as you said, uh, life keeps mm. moving, revolving. Like the second image is more impressionable to me mm. uh, rather than the first one, just the, uh, you know, the uh, art, I mean, the yellow pumpkin standing still there. Rather, the other one, uh, you know, going through the, uh, you know, trials and tribulations of life. <laughs> that is what is reflected <laughs> if you look at it. I guess one thing people need to keep in mind while making an artwork on a, you know, maybe near a sea or maybe in any, you know, public location, maybe it's a park or garden, but like you have to take care that you keep it in such a way or like locate it in such a way that it doesn't ruin the natural beauty also, you know, because you have to keep that in mind too. You're making an artwork, but at the same time, you have to respect the natural beauty of the area. So you put it there where that looks where it's biodegradable, as you said. So if like something happens, it's not ruining the water or anything. So and also that it looks good and doesn't ruin the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I have a comment kind of relating to this on how it can relate to the environment, but it's a bit different. I'll come to it later. Uh, Tanu, 
Yeah, uh, just uh, reflection that, of course, it's very bright, the, mm -hmm. the way the picture looks. And what I feel is it's like, even if you stand on a shore, wherever you're standing, you are standing there, right? You are there in that mm -hmm. moment. So the thing is that this pumpkin is there itself. The, the background is, it, of course, the, the sea is always moving. So it's just like the time will keep on traveling. You're there as a person traveling with the time and then how you can balance it up because of course the waves and everything will come as the other people also mentioned is how you keep your balance intact. I guess the pumpkin shows that. You are there mm -hmm. at, in that time, in that moment. If you can ask, uh, what is the relevance of this yellow pumpkin at that particular place? Is there any, you know, meaning in that kind of an art installation? I don't know about the meaning. Um, I know Yayoi Kusama, the artist, she does a lot of work with dots and uh, she also talks about how it relates to her her own like vision, you know, how she sees things and in her childhood, how she would think of things and so on. Like it has a lot to do with this kind of congestion and I don't know if you look at a lot of her artwork, it's very similar. I mean, it's usually the use of dots. I don't know about the meaning and I, I don't I don't know if there is a meaning yeah. per okay. se. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, uh, I didn't I one could look at in, uh, Yeah. May I go on? Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Sorry. I just couldn't hear properly. Yeah, one could one could look at the pumpkin as a replacement for something else. So perhaps some other object was envisioned in the place of a pumpkin and uh, maybe the artist has replaced that object with this pumpkin. I was wondering that because I've seen a lot of, you know, uh, photographs and paintings of sunken ships, people struggling to get out of the water. So mm. perhaps this is some kind of euphemism here. Mm. Maybe, uh, but then again, well, I don't know if she saw it in her original plan to, you know, have it out at sea, um, kind of struggling to stay afloat. That's an interesting connection to draw. But then again, when she put it near the sea, she would have thought of that was. I remember this one. I remember this one photograph from a few years ago of migrant crisis when a few migrants had drowned on the shore of a, a yeah. European country while crossing yeah. from you know, Africa and this uh, uh, corpse of a dying baby was replaced with an object and then uh, put forth in an art installation. I was thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, Sanaya, and then we'll move on. Yeah, like uh, the, the sea is behind the yellow pumpkin and it's moving and maybe the yellow pumpkin is still so maybe the artist had kind of a sentiment towards it like maybe you know there's something there which she doesn't want to change it just wants to stay still and you know be there for a long time so maybe that can be a story behind this yellow pumpkin yeah that's a really interesting kind of thing way of thinking about it i think uh, uh i just wanted to ask something not related to what you are showing right now on the slide I just want to know what is when you see a work of art, are there some specific markers that you're supposed to look at in order to uh, sort of find out what the artist has got in his mind? Because at the end of the day, it's a very subjective interpretation. So are there some specific, I'm sure you are taught some of those things in, in art school. Since I don't know anything about it, I'm just asking you uh, as a very lay person, are there some markers that you're supposed to, whether in terms of like in the paintings, you said, the, you know, the strokes. Similarly, use of colors. Similarly, here in this, there are these dots. I mean, are there some specific markers that we are supposed to look at in order to get into the head of the artist who has actually uh, uh, drawn something or created something? Uh, so I'm actually a history student. I've not formally studied art. Um, I've done it myself and I, I've learned a lot about art history itself. But okay. I would say that it's um, it's... So there are objective things you can look at, right? So just in terms of generally how we think of anything visual, so the form or the shape or the colors or, uh, you know, things like that, the elements of the artwork. Um, but then a lot of it is subjective. It's about your reaction to it. So uh, it might be, it might be something that you 
it could be something you feel when you're in that the presence of that artwork or um, maybe you don't also understand it and that's part of how you you know some of some artworks are meant to just challenge you and kind of disrupt your way of thinking you know you'll be just confused how is this an artwork or what is it makes you question what is an artwork or what is what is something aesthetic or what is something beautiful um so there are two ways of thinking about it i don't i wouldn't personally say there are any markers but these are just two ways i would say that you can think about artworks i don't know if this is um a good answer for you i mean you can ask again if it's not yeah no it's fine okay yeah um hmm, okay but i mean i other than that i think there are other ways of engaging you can look into the history or the context in which it was made or if they have a small note next to it it tells you something about the artwork and that's maybe helpful to understand it more um so I just want to move on. Um, so, okay, the purpose of public art, so this relates to what we, the discussion we had earlier. The purpose of public art is also to make you confront something, right? So it might be something uncomfortable um, that is not quite appropriate or you don't want to see that reality. Um, so if you choose to go to a museum or an exhibition, you expect to see what's, uh, works of art, um, that thing, you know, things that, you like things that you don't like things that you don't understand or that are surprising but then public art is just out there right it's around places we live uh, it's in the streets uh, so in some ways we have no choice but to come across it um, a lot of public art actually makes use of this uh, and that's the point right it it speaks about social issues uh, so people are, you, are forced to think about what the questions it's provoking so this is I have two small kind of sub uh, examples under this. The first one of, is of the Fearless Collective. So this is an art collective that was started in uh, 2012. And it's in response to the sexual violence uh, against women in India and the fear of occupying public space uh, as a woman. So uh, an art collective is a kind of group of artists and curators and so on that support each other. And their aim was to make women and queer people visible in these public spaces by creating murals of them on large walls in cities. Um, and they have done this in a number of countries now. So their work is also public in the sense that they immerse themselves in uh, the communities in that area and they hold workshops with them and they also create these murals with them. So a recent artwork um, that they made is called Essential Delhi and it's created with the organization Chintan uh, which deals, and this artwork deals with women who are workers in the waste management sector. So when the pandemic started uh, and the country-wide lockdown was imposed, many of these workers' lives were seen as disposable. Um, and they weren't, you know, they continued working without protective gear. Uh, they didn't have much government support either. So um, they conducted workshops with many of these women and they set out to create this uh, mural. Uh, I think it's in Lodi Art District, um, and the text on the mural says, our lives matter, my life matters. And it's meant to provoke a conversation on um, who deserves dignity of labor, since many of these women were also Dalit women and uh, Muslim women. So um, it also looks at how gender and caste and class intersect. So they don't just face discrimination in, um, because of their gender, uh, because of their caste actually, uh, but as women also, there's an added set of difficulties. Um, for example, accessing clean toilets or, you know, when they're menstruating, for example, uh, or, you know, roles within the family that are put on them along with this work that they undertake. Um, so this is not actually the full mural. I think it's much, it extends to the right. But uh, this, I think this was a good picture I got. Um, so does anyone have any responses to this? Um, you know, have you seen anything familiar? I've seen like, quite a bit of work by the Fearless Collective before this in Bangalore. I know they have a lot of work in Bangalore, but yeah. If anyone has any... You know, the, the red fort there, it's it's symbolic that it's supposed to be, in the, you know, it's supposed to be symbol of our independence. And, you know, we have on the 15th of August every year that is being celebrated. And yet, yet on the wall, you have Fearless being written. And, you know, uh, um, uh, so where is that freedom that we are talking about that, you know, fear from 
I, I do think there is that connect that you know uh, uh, and since it is and also the fact that you know you have that uh, a set of chairs and women of all uh, uh, you know, belonging to all, or is it? That's not a picture. That's a picture, right? That's not a part of the drawing. No, that's not a part of the thing. Yeah. So right. these, ha, are, correct, these are. I think people ha. are taking part in the workshop. Yeah. 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 yeah correct. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Then. Then that's it. That's it. I just saw that. Uh, uh, I suddenly realized that is not the picture. It's somebody who's yeah. uh, they actually sitting there. But yeah, I guess the the two are collect the fearless and. You know, so close to the place from where we sort of. Unfurl the national flag. Uh, kind of, um, they kind of expose the uh, the contradictions. I mean, the contradictions yeah. are very well, sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my reading. This fearless mm -hmm. and all that. Of course, the flag is not there, but that mm -hmm. is symbolic of who we are and what we should be. Yeah. Uh, if I can add on to yeah. what, uh, you know, this is the time period I think we were all focusing on when uh, the movement of Black Lives Matter. So in, you know, parallel to that, many a times yeah. we tend to ignore what is happening around us mm -hmm. rather and we focus more on the outside. So mm -hmm. it's like there are people in our vicinity who are facing all kinds of discrimination, but we yeah. tend to look somewhere else. So it's like, uh, you know, similar to, you know, Black Lives Matter, My Life Matters. So it's yeah. like putting forth our, the people or the problems of our own people are in the forefront. That's my thing, which I, which, which I got. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's a very valid connection to draw. As in, you can tell, because it was so recent, and I'm going to come to the Black Lives Matter movement uh, soon as well. Uh, but then, yeah, I think, that was a very good point to bring up um, because also the Dalit community and the black community have historically been very kind of drawn from each other, uh, like the Black Panthers, move, uh, Black Panthers and the Dalit Panthers, uh, Panthers for example. But yeah, I think at that time, especially like you said, um, there were a lot of activists and so on who were talking about how people don't look at caste, um, and a lot of Indians, especially diaspora Indians talk a lot about race and they're not willing to look inward um, at our own country. Yeah. Um, Kesha? Yeah, I just wanted to give examples of similar uh, public art I've seen uh, prominently mm -hmm. in this uh, Pinjara Sword campaign that's organized mm -hmm. by, you know, girls in Delhi University campus. They were protesting mm -hmm. against poster curfew timing. And then they had pictures of girls of prison or cage and for a few times yeah. alongside that you can't. And after that, they had also raised certain other issues. So I particularly remember this one art in Sule where they lived inside, put on sanitary canvases with red colored sort of blood looking thing to you know make some awareness about them so taboo to talk about that mm -hmm. another example would be the shaheen bagh sitting yeah. against the citizenship amendment act that happened mm -hmm. in delhi so you know yeah. around my house there is was a sitting and i could see a lot of these public art displays mm -hmm. photographs paintings you know pieces of poetry printed out on huge canvases and put on the faces. That was a good example of public art yeah. in the city of there. Yeah. Uh, is there one more hand, somebody else? Or anyone else who wants to add something? But yeah, I mean, when Kesha was talking, that was quite a vivid image from that time. Um, the library at Shahinbag and then the artwork next to it, yeah. Uh, anyone else? Okay. All right. Uh, so another type of public art, um, like I was saying earlier, is indirect conversation with the environment, right? So um, they also give us insight into how public spaces and public opinion is always changing and how art can be part of that historical process. 
So um, in the latter part of 2018, an art installation appeared at the foot of the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol on Anti-Slavery Day. So Edward Colston was a sea merchant in the 17th century, and uh, later he was part of the Royal African Company. Um, and he was considered to be a philanthropic figure for a long time before his uh, part in the Atlantic, Atlantic slave trade um, came under scrutiny in the 1990s. So the city of Bristol, initially, they intended to put a plaque under that statue addressing this issue um, but and to contextualize uh, him, uh, but then this never happened. And the work addressed this by creating a number of concrete figures lying down surrounding the statue in the shape of a slave ship. So the statue was later toppled into the Bristol Harbor. That was quite a famous event in early 2020 uh, as part of the Black Lives Matter movement and in specific uh, in response to the murder of George, George Floyd in 2020 uh, in May. Uh, and then actually the graffiti statue was put on, recovered and put on display um, somewhere in Bristol in a museum. And it was briefly replaced by um, a statue of a Black Lives Matter activist called Jen Reed in mid 2020, but I think the city took that one down. Uh, so yeah, does anyone have any thoughts on these types of artworks or this installation in particular? Um, something that stuck out to me was that they put the graffiti statue on display. And I think that's an interesting way of talking about these kind of histories because you make, you know, you don't remove the what people have put on it, the graffiti that's there, but you're making it visible, all of the history of that object and the history of the figure themselves. So it's, I think, yeah, it's an interesting way of dealing with, especially colonial histories. But again, this artwork in specific, I think it's quite impactful uh, because from far, it also looks like feet, the, the figures, right, uh, which are lying down. So it's like feet of people standing on that ship. Um, yeah, any thoughts on this or, you know, anything related to this? Um, I mean, something I just thought of now was also, you know, these um, in European countries, these kind of difficult or for them awkward to contend with histories. Um, you know, it's something that again is, it's not appropriate, it's not okay. I mean, people would say it's not appropriate in a public space, but then this kind of art really makes, it throws it in your face and it says, you have to confront this history. You can't keep, you know, living with these, you can't just keep pushing these kind of colonial histories under the rug, um, yeah. Any sometimes it doesn't even have to be through art you know sometimes it's there in the subconsciousness they know about it and they know they owe an apology but they don't for example in the case of the Jalanwala Bagh incident we saw the British and India we never had uh, an apology from the from the British uh, administration they have at best they have regretted what has happened but there hasn't ever been an apology so even yeah. though it has not probably been put up as a as a part of art you know in the public consciences in the in the in the, in the popular public conscience this is something which is there i mean it you just can't whether or not it is you know reflected through art it is very much there and they do know that this is something that should not have happened uh, yeah but it's up to the administration to actually come out formally officially with a word of apology which hasn't happened even though they have regretted many such in, you know other uh, administrations have regretted for example the, the Australians have regretted for what they have done to the Aborigin. So, uh, you know, similarly, the Americans have regretted to what they have done to the Red Indians, but we've never had a regret, uh, a, a, sorry, not regret, sorry, an apology, an official apology from, uh, from what has, uh, from the British administration to what has happened in India, uh, especially in Jalinwala Bagh. And it is there in their, uh, it's public memory. It's not something that uh, they're not aware of. So it's just that it's, it's kept alive by memories that have, you know, uh, sort of passed on from one generation to the other, uh, even amongst yeah. the, uh, the British. Yeah, on that note, before we go on to the other people who raise their hands, I think this is also part of that larger kind of conversation on reparations and how would you, you know, 
how would you make reparations for something that's so uh, so powerfully impacted a whole you know continent or more than a continent actually and also i mean what would be enough to i mean also in the context of like museums having a lot of stolen looted artwork you know is it enough should we give it back and all this all of these conversations happening but yeah um that was just to bring that up but yeah sanaya yeah i'm so sorry to interrupt but i'll have to leave now because yeah, yeah. i have another class okay and as this will be scheduled so okay yeah, thank you i really yeah. like you're video. almost done yeah all right thank you for being here thank you bye bye uh, kesha yeah when someone mentioned about jallianwala bag i was wondering about the recent things that have happened so uh, there was an article in the hindu a few weeks uh, ago i think about how the government of india has renovated the jallianwala bag and covered some of the you know things like the well where people were thrown in or jumped into and sort of aestheticized and renovated it instead of restoring that place so you know mm-hmm. So looking at Jallianwala Bagh Memorial as an art installation, in that sense, uh, what is this obsession with aesthetic? Uh, make making it more aesthetic instead of things that kind of makes you uncomfortable. So that open well used to make people uncomfortable. Those things that were broken or you know, yeah, out of order used to make people uncomfortable. But now this sort of renovation or aesthetic, mm. uh, make making it more aesthetic. you know i have some kind of problem with that because now it's an artwork that is pleasing to the senses but it has lost the meaning that it used to convey by that you know uncomfortable elements yeah yeah on that note i think a lot of times with a lot of governments or like yeah they usually there's this it depends i mean it's very contextual but then there is this um move to kind of make something that's standard or something that's even in terms of i don't know if for example a state has a particular reputation then they need to standard they start standardizing everything to make it more you know sellable and so on but then i was also thinking it's it's you take something uncomfortable and then you package it in a way that's sort of you know people can accept it or more appealing and attractive to the mm-hmm. tourist kind yeah but then like someone was saying a lot of i think a lot of the impact lies in leaving it as it is so the bullet holes or something like that you know leaving that as it is and that's where yeah but the, because the people who go there they actually want to go and uh, i can't say they want to feel the pain if it is not possible but at least they want to be one with that for the little one minute or five minutes that they are there they just want to reflect on what would have happened to the yeah. people who were there so if you make it appear so glamorous and you know whatever uh, that entire impact of the place is gone because you are not surrounded by things that make you uncomfortable you are rather comfortable in seeing what you are seeing so the i don't know whether the the idea of uh, visiting ajalanwala bag the the experience would continue to be the same i mean those who have been there once earlier and would go there again probably would be able to make out the difference mm. but those who are going for the first time i don't know whether they missed out on something that should have been more real as far as an experience to experience mm. something that people would have gone through so many years back i'm not sure mm. about that i wanted to talk about this larger kind of thing i think the larger point is also making a certain kind of narrative but then i think we do that in all ways like even in in putting a, a plaque at a monument we are creating some sort of narrative about history or about the the impact or you know the previous impact of that monument so it is a kind of rewriting of a narrative um i mean i'm not i don't know um i'm not siding with anything but yeah uh, no uh, hitisha go on this has nothing to do with jalia wala bag but the fact that the figure is made uh, is carved out of black stone also emphasizes that black lives matter even though maybe the first 
and who is being harmed would or may not have been blamed. I didn't hear the last part. The even though the person who made it, not the person who made it, like the person who's being depicted, like uh, the statue by the statue. That person may not have been black, but using black stone also symbolizes that black. I okay. I don't know if that is intentional in any way because that the statue is quite old, and it was not. Uh, the statue is actually anti, not not anti black, but it. Uh, like I said earlier, he was actually part of the Atlantic Atlantic slave trade. So even though the stone is black, I don't think anything about it was particularly, you know, from good feeling to black people. Um, but yeah, I think that's just some sort of coincidence. I don't know. I didn't. I don't know particularly what material it is, um, but yeah. Um, okay, this is just the summary now. So to summarize, we looked at different mediums of art that we come across in our lives. Uh, the way we categorize, the ways of categorizing art, like art movement and the term artist, and how these are historically formed. And we also looked at the different purposes of art and how it's used in different places or fields. Uh, from history to studying the film industry or political movements. Um, so this is the end of the session. I hope you all took something away from it um, on how looking at images or engaging with art is not a straightforward process. Uh, it involves different fields and the understanding of historical context and processes. Um, so it's not just about looking at art, but understanding the way that art has been looked at or categorized. Um, yeah. So to end, I just want to thank the Siegel Foundation of the Arts for hosting this series. And thank you so much, everyone who joined today. I genuinely, we had so much interaction. I think I took a lot away from it myself. Yep, that's it. I just, um, we can still continue talking if anyone has anything to add or ask. Thank you, Angel. I think this was uh, this was really a very, very special uh, session. And I'm sure all the participants agree with me. And each one of you actually has contributed a great deal to um, the rich uh, thoughts and, uh, uh, you know, questions that provoke that uh, Angel brought for all of us. And um, in a way, what you started uh, last week, you know, with this question of what is art, this, the past two hours have actually been answering that question through and through, you know, and um, both through your presentation and the questions and responses that were coming from the participants, uh, you know, from what appeals to what provokes to what uh, inspires questioning to what confuses the entire gamut. And uh, the one thing that, you know, I mean, there's so many things that th through the session that, you know, I wanted to keep interjecting with, but I didn't. But the one thing that I do want to say is particularly for the teachers who are here with us, you know, uh, one of the, one of the uh, major incentives for us at uh, Seagull and History for Peace to uh, have organized, you know, have hosted a session of this nature is because this is, we, we've never really consciously directly done anything about uh, uh, something that really bothers us a lot. Although all the work we do is, uh, um, is always connected to the arts, but you know, this whole issue of um, our education system, not paying the kind of attention to art classes that uh, we should be, and also the possibility that possibilities uh, that exist, you know, within um, uh, within what we call the art subject, which a child goes through through their entire school life. So, so I just want to request um, the teachers who are here that uh, you know it would be nice if we all start thinking about how we can go beyond art being drawing 
and you know, trying to bring some of its potential into the classroom, irrespective of what we are teaching. It doesn't have to be the art period. It could be literature, it could be history, it could be geography, it could be mathematics, anything. There are endless possibilities. So this, this is something that I just wanted to flag off before we conclude. And thank you once again, all of you. On that note, I just wanted to um, just share this. Sorry, I think I didn't share these. These were my references and my sources. So the book, um, this is another very good book on art history. Uh, and this is material related to the module. So there's just very different web websites you can look at. Um, and I think we'll be sharing this in the email with you. So if you want to learn more, uh, there's a lot here, yeah. That's all. We're also uh, 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 planning to turn this into like a lesson plan, which would be up uploaded on the website. So once, if any of you want to refer to it once again, at a later stage, it will be made available. Ranita, do you want to add something? Um, Ranita is very it, excited about it. Took a these yeah. sessions yeah it took a lot of restraint to not like keep yeah. joining every single conversation that Adrian was starting but like there's too much today like I I can maybe like just I, okay I'll try and keep it really short and I'll share two thoughts one was when everyone was talking about Jalianwala Bagh and Adrian was saying how even the installation of a plaque is itself also imposing a certain narrative, right? It is creating a certain narrative at any rate. And if one looks at the history of, you know, what we now, I mean, what we now call as the Bhima Koregao case and where it began, like historically, and what the problem is, it has directly got links with how something has been memorialized and how one community is offended by this narrative. So, you know, examples of that everywhere. And regarding the Jallianwala Park thing, I mean, because we were all discussing it, I think the reason why it's so, I mean, for me at least, that it's so offensive to the eye is because the it seems like a proper, like a full-scale state-funded project to forget. Because, you know, I went to Amritsar for the first time when I was in class 11. I was really excited. I had grown up on the usual diet of lots of Bhagat Singh films and you know, been very excited about reading this section of history and all of that, Indian history. So when I went there, I was really like prepared for something incredible and, you know, like it was going to be a special moment. And then I turned up there and it was a park. It was a park which had people selling bhel puri. There were lovers sitting around as lovers do in parks, you know, and, and I was like, okay, this is not what I was expecting. And then I found the section, the well and the section, and that still brought out moments. So I think like it would be unrealistic to expect a historical site to stay intact. Like, of course, it changes and it's a part of a public space after that. But taking on a project that actually changes the whole mood of the place actively, I think like there's a difference between the two. So yeah, that. And uh, about the public statues, the second point I was going to say is that Calcutta, in Calcutta itself, there's a place called Flagstaff House, I think, in Barakpur. So that and Victoria Memorial's grounds, for instance, became two places where a lot of the colonial statues, because I mean, since Calcutta was the colonial capital at one point, we had statues at every intersection, right? So those had to be removed. But interestingly, they were not removed right after 47. It was some 20, 22 years later, when all these were kind of pushed onto the grounds of the Victoria Memorial, which, by the way, itself has had a lot of its collections recently replaced by a Netaji or Subhash Chandra Bose themed exhibition and collection. So a lot of the older stuff has got uh, back into the archives uh, and storage. So, yeah, j just that about statues, because I remember, I think, Taputi uh, Guha Thakuta, who Angel also listed as one of her sources and material uh, research material uh, sources so I think she too at one point I, she had this very interesting line where you know which can one can think about when thinking about something like Black Lives Matter all of that which is about how these public statues they kind of remain you know uh, lifeless until there is a moment of friction when they suddenly become personification of you know, whatever they are a statue of. Until then, it's just part of your surroundings, right? It doesn't uh, matter so much. So yeah, that's it.
I this I tried my best to put short. I don't think I succeeded very. Yeah, much. and yeah. this this last point that Ranita mentioned is also uh, you know one of the things that we talk about, right? They remain a part of our surroundings because we let them remain a part of our uh, surroundings in an in a very innate man manner. And this is also something that the education system can do something about, right? Because uh, it lends itself, uh, uh, the, these are all points of references that lend, lend themselves to the teaching of history and to bringing multiple perspectives into the teaching of history. Okay, I think we should end now, otherwise we'll just carry on. But I, the, the one last thing for Angel, I think, you know, Angel, two sessions don't make a series. <laughs> Maybe six yeah. sessions can define a series. That's all I wanted to say to you. Can I just add one last thing? So if you don't promise not to take more than a minute. It's the last thing I was just going to say since Megha was just talking about how you know part of the reason you was talking about the reasons for doing this series, right? So before we got to the series, History for Peace has made a lot of content which is on using the arts in teaching history and other social sciences. So if any of you want to take a look, please visit the History for Peace website resources, go to the resources section and you will find work with Shobda Thor's artwork. You will find like actually any of our teaching resources you will find uses a lot of the arts. So it might be a good thing to go to uh, right after, you know, you've experienced this session and the kinds of conversations we had here. Might be easier to implement like a also, so, if you become, yeah. uh, you know, if you sign up as a member, there's a there's a there's a portion there's a section on the website that allows you to put up your own lesson plans. It allows you to make uh, you know form groups to discuss with other educators across the subcontinent. So please do take a look at it, and it'd be great if you're actively involved uh, on the website. Yeah. I've just shared the link, the website link. Or in the chat, so take a look whenever you can. All right, we should. There's a I hand think... raised. Oops. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Tatu, I think your hand is raised. I think that's what Angel was referring to. No. Okay, I think we should wind up then. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you all once again. And thank you, Angel, thank you. very much. You haven't heard thank the end of us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. bye. bye.